Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. We're here to give you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. We are here on Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Mondays at 1 a.m., Wednesdays at 9 a.m. for a special edition of Tell Me Your Story. And uh, we are uh, also podcasting, or uh, I should say we're streaming live at those times. But yes, we are podcasting at uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and many other locations. You can also watch these interviews on YouTube. I also hope that you'll subscribe or at the very least click notification, notification so that when I post a new conversation, you'll know it's there and you'll be able to go and listen to it. This conversation is going to be very interesting. We're going to find out uh, about a very interesting subject that we actually talked about um, maybe a year or two ago, uh, but it was uh, titled a little differently. Uh, titled meaning that the author's uh, book had to do more with sociopaths and psychopaths. We're kind of along the same lines today because we're going to be talking about uh, narcissism and narcissists. The title of the book is and I hope I've got the pronunciation from my guest correct, Narctionary. It is the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Dictionary. And uh, my guest is the author, Dr. Tracy Kemble. Tra Dr. Kemble, thank you so much for being with us here on the program. Thank you. <laughs> Pardon me. Thank you for inviting me. I'm excited to be here and talk about a subject that needs to be talked about. Oh, boy, does it ever, um, especially considering what we've been through, specifically uh, the last six or seven years. Uh, but I know this is not a modern day situation. This has been going on since man has been on the planet. Uh, but it seems to be not necessarily, I, and I hope I'm correct here, not necessarily more pronounced but it's just more visible specifically because of social media. Um, I, I would agree with that. And I would also agree that it's, it's also a term that's, that's thrown around. And so there's, there's a difference between somebody having a, a bad day and being a jerk or an unempathetic moment versus somebody who actually has narcissistic characteristics or NPD or antisocial personality or sociopath, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you know, um, I can I, I I can say that I, in my growing up in school, um, I was bullied. Now I don't know that I'd necessarily call necessarily call the bullies narcissists or psychopaths or sociopaths. Um, plus the fact that I never did follow them after school, and um, in terms of after I got out of school, to know what their career choices were or their directions in life. Cause I didn't care. I just wanted to get as far away from them as I could. Um, and that's kind of the way a lot of us feel these days with those who are prominent, especially in the media, we, we are bombarded uh, both uh, in the media and in social media and so forth uh, by these images and these words and the language. And it's like, first, if I could, if I could shut off the network, if I could just get rid of the internet for me, for me, and never have to deal with it again, and not watch any television, not pick up any newspapers, I'd be a happy camper. But that's not something that's really possible. Now, am I? And again, I am not a. I I do not play the victimhood game. Okay, in the 2016 campaign for president, I dubbed it the victimhood campaign because that's what they were saying. It's everybody else's fault that we are the way we are and I'm going to fix it. So my question to you to start off with is, am I a victim of narcissistic abuse? Well, I would have to ask a lot of questions in order to be able to answer that because, you know, just because, again, somebody has a bad day or is being a jerk, it doesn't mean that they're a narcissist. If it is a constant 
characteristic within their personality. That's when it's diagnosed as a personality disorder. And that's when you're actually dealing with somebody who has narcissism. The amount of exposure, it, narcissistic abuse causes trauma. And it doesn't matter if it happens once or if it happens 1,000 times, that it runs the risk of, of causing trauma at any one of those interactions. And so, you know, depending on your personality, uh, your your history, somebody can say and do something and that thing can just go in and, and, and set you for a whammy. Um, or if you've exposed, been exposed to it for a, a long period of time, that trauma wound will run much deeper. But I think that each and every one of us, you know, one of the definitions of abuse is, is that I give abuse is have the words or actions of another person ever harmed you? And not a single one of us can't raise our hand and say, yeah, I've been hurt by the words or actions of another person. Well, that's that means that we have encountered some sort of an abuse from another person. Does that make them abusive or does that make them um, having just a bad day or or a, a season of of not their shining brightest moment? It all depends on how long the, the tendencies goes and how much a part of their natural character these actions and reactions are. But at the same time, wouldn't it all to say all blah, wouldn't it also say of that individual uh, by society maybe well, you're just weak. You just, you know, you need to toughen up. You need a man or woman up. Put your big boy, big girl pants on, you know. Uh, and I hear this often that, uh, hey, like in politics in particular, that, uh, you know, they they didn't mean what they said. They're just running for office and they say what they're going to say. And I say, that's the whole point. See, I say words have power. Words have power. People use the words that they use for a specific purpose, which means they have power. Yes. So agreed. that that tells me. Uh, maybe on the one hand, uh, there's that old saying, you know it, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I and don't I would, agree with it. I, I say I, sticks and stones can break your bones and words can cause the final blows that will kill your self-esteem. Wow. Yeah. Um, there's also another phrase that uh, I have also found is not true. And that is that you can't change other people. Actually, you can, but you can't do it intentionally. You do it by changing yourself, and then the people around you are either going to change or they're going to get as far away from you as they can. Yes, so, and I think it works negatively and positively. I okay. think that, you know, if we want to influence a person, inspire, in the true essence of the word, mm -hmm. uh, another person into change, our energy and our behaviors can inspire them to change themselves. So I believe that we're all responsible for our own choice to change. And I do believe that that we can change. On the negative side of that, you know, when I was exposed to, to very traumatic, abusive situations, I learned to fear people. And I did change because I was the most trusting person in the world to, you know, to fault to the point that I learned to fear people based on my in interactions with that person fast forward in my life. I've also learned not to fear people because of new information that, that I've been given. So I think we're ever evolving beings and we're, we are never, we are never the same. And I don't agree that people can't change. And I don't agree that we can't uh, inspire people to become a better definition of themselves. Now, I find it interesting, and I'm going to bring up a particular part of our society that we have, uh, an institution specifically, um, and that is our uh, our penal, a penal. I almost said penal colonies. We don't have penal colonies. Um, you know the the prison system, all right? The corrections institution, and it is there not only for people to serve their time, but hopefully hopefully to get some rehabilitation because if that wasn't possible then what's the point we might as well just go ahead and be pro-life and execute everybody that goes to prison because they cannot be, re be rehabilitated but you and i are firm believers that people can change right people can change if they want to change people can change it's it's the want it's no different than the alcoholic the alcoholic will stop drinking as soon as 
they realize that their behaviors are more painful than a life without, without those behaviors that cause people to leave them. So other, other non drinkers can be around them and show them how possible it is to remain sober. And as they get sober and become, you know, a, a more compatible person to be with better versions of love will show up and then they can become inspired by, you know, new ways of looking at life and new ways of loving life. But we all have to do our own work. Mm -hmm. We all have to do our own work. I know that that is a, a, a big phrase that I started learning back in the 80s. Now I'm 63 years old now. I went through some personal growth and development programs like LifeSpring back in the early 80s. It was an offshoot mm -hmm. of EST. And that was absolutely one of the things that they enforced in us, that we're not here to change you. You chose to be here. And that was another point they made, too. A lot of people would complain the very first night, oh, I don't want to be here. This is uncomfortable and da 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 So the facilitator basically said, those of you who are complaining, you're lying to yourself because if you didn't want to be here, you wouldn't be. But guess where you are? And so the changing process, the transformation began. Mm -hmm. When it comes to now, we are. are uh, let me let me back this up and ask you this. Are we talking of both about the narcissist and about the abused of the narcissist? Well, that's a really good question because what people don't understand is when any of us enter into a relationship, we are both doing something to make that relationship sustainable or non-sustainable. So the question becomes, what are the dynamics that make a, a narcissistic abusive relationship sustainable? Well, there are two environments that make a, a narcissistic relationship sustainable. A narcissist plus a narcissist. And these people are literally just getting high off of the, the attention that their partner gets. And because narcissists don't see other people as other independent people, they see them as an extension of themselves. So if the people they love um, gets uh, attention, they see it that they're getting attention, right? So it's a narcissist plus a narcissist or... The other, the other dynamic is a narcissist plus a self-deprecate. And so this is when the, the bully and the victim enable each other to reinforcing the messages that are inside them and keeping the toxicity of the relationship alive. In an interview that I did regarding uh, sociopaths and psychopaths, the, the author and guest of the, on the program said that as bad as it might seem uh, that a sociopath sociopath or psychopath or even a narcissist because we did use that word no matter how bad they might seem we can still learn from them and his point was though the the ends do not justify the means they get things done well sometimes they do at least they want to they want it to appear as though they get things done when in fact maybe they don't but nonetheless uh, they said, yeah, we can learn something from them. Do you believe that we can learn something as opposed to finding ways of protecting ourselves? Actually, there are there traits within the narcissistic behavior that we could look at and glean little bits and pieces and shards <laughs> from that hologram? I think, I mean, absolutely, because, you know, there's there's a very famous saying that says we can even learn from a fool. And so, you know, it, if we are the students of life, we can always learn how many people listening to this have been exposed to an awful situation and say, I will never treat another person that way. Well, we learned that from, you know, somebody who mistreated us or mistreated somebody that we love. Uh, on the flip side of that, you know, that it, this is a big, I, I'm running a workshop and it's called, So Your Boss Slash Coworker is a Narcissist. And, uh, you know, the thing about the narcissistic personality is that uh, and i'm not talking sociopath or psychopath okay, okay. and we're, we're talking very dangerous people that i believe we need to stay away from because they they literally don't care if they harm another human being where lacking empathy is different than not caring if you harm another human uh human being but that's a whole deep subject that we won't go into right this mm. second All right. but that being said that many 
many narcissists, many, many traits of what narcissists do when they're implementing jobs and executing events can come across very narcissistic. It's, uh, it's the demand. It's like, there is not room for emotion right now that we have to execute. There's, you know, because narcissists lack emotion. They don't care if you're happy or sad. It's about executing the project. It's about getting to the bottom, um, getting through the crisis. Um, is it, is it a model, a module that I would recommend people uh, learn and study? I would say no. I would say, you know, the, the concept of, of, you know, there's no tears in the boardroom is is a true one that if you're going if you're talking about business it's it's business you have to remove your emotions about it if you're talking about uh human beings you have to put the emotional factor into it mm -hmm. and a narcissist doesn't have the ability to do that they just remove emotion um, most of the time you've been involved in this particular area for 30 years and you've put together this this dictionary and when we come back here uh, after I make these uh, final few words here, I want to talk to you about some of the words in okay. the, uh, and it sounds weird because it's narcissist, but it's narctionary. Like a dictionary, <laughs> only a narctionary. A narctionary. At first, when you read that narctionary, oh, is this about drugs and, narc and, and a narc? who is trying to catch people with drugs? No, well, not exactly, no. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Tracy Kimball, and you are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it is really a pleasure to have Dr. Tracy Kimball here, author of Narctionary. It is the uh, Narcissist Abuse, Narcissistic, get the whole word in there, Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Dictionary, I have a funny, suspicious feeling this is probably not going to become an audible, <laughs> although it would be kind of interesting to read, to say the very least. What is a what is sun syndrome? Oh, the sun syndrome. OK, you know what? One of the things I, I love to do is I love to have people open the book and and go to the part of the the book. So let me just find my son syndrome. There we go. Uh, That's son when uh, everybody turned to page 264 in your hymnal. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let me just read it because sure. uh, just to get it right. So a son syndrome, uh, the category is that it is an abuse technique. And I, I categorize each word with something that lets it know, is it a recovery word? Is it abuse, abusive word? Is it a trauma um, so it's a, sorry, it's a trauma, it's a trauma response. And the sun syndrome is where both the narcissist and the victim believe that everyone in the environment is supposed to revolve around the environment, around the narcissist. So what this is, is just like, you know, it, we, we circle, right? Mm -hmm. In our atmosphere, we circle. Yep. The narcissist believes that all roads lead back to them that the only thoughts in the house need to be their thoughts that everybody takes on that the that um the only praise in the house unless it's deemed given permission to other people it all needs to go back and it's it's a family training system where rather than um let's say it's a parent that is a narcissist that you're able to say gosh you know dad i i, I don't agree with that statement and here's why, and then there could be a teaching moment or an expansive moment, that type of stuff is forbidden in the house because it will cause a narcissistic episode. So it's this brainwashing that people learn at um, in within a family unit or a cult situation. It could also happen in, in work environments and church environments where it's like, don't book the, the almighty one. And, you know, because if there's, two, if you do, there's ramifications, the narcissist will get mad at you, they will disown you, they will gossip behind your back, you, they will abuse you, um, they will, you know, threaten you with withdrawing love and affection. So the, the sun syndrome is when the narcissist believes that they are the brightest room and the only light that can shine in the room. And from the victim standpoint is when they have been taught to honor that system. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, let's take, uh, and by the way, the, when you started to describe it, the first phrase that came to my mind, this is a phrase from the narcissist. It's all about me. <laughs> yeah. 
Now, I will tell you, I'd like to think this was not a narcissistic moment at the age of five or six years of age. But I remember be, uh, being outside and playing, and all of a sudden, this thought came to my mind. Do you remember the uh, the the movie uh, Men in Black and the scene in the operating room where they had this giant alien, and they cracked open the head, and inside was this tiny little critter, right, who was basically running the show. He was manipulating the body and making it move and everything, right? Well, as a five year old. I didn't think I was an alien inside, but I was a tiny little thing inside the body, inside the head, looking out the eyes, listening out the ears, speaking and so forth, and that everybody else was here for me. Now, I don't think a five-year-old even knows or has had enough experience to be narcissistic, even though well, children, children <laughs> kind of are, but that's, that's a, different, is, that's a different is. kind of narcissism, isn't it? It is a different type of narcissism. It is that, you know, the, the brain is still developing and and children are in a survival mode that if they don't have their parents, they, they will die. And so therefore, I would say if I see it in, in a five year old, that is still part of the developmental process that, that, you know, around what, three, four years old, the favorite word of a child is me, 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 <laughs> me, 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 me. And it takes a while to outgrow that, to socialize the children, to learn that siblings matter, too. And, and it, it is a challenging time in parental raising, but um, it is a narcissistic trait, but I would call it more of an innocent narcissistic trait in children. And the most important thing is that you see your child grow out of that, that as long as you can start to see, okay, now they're being able to understand empathy and learning that life exists outside of themselves, then, then you're on the right track. Right. Now, the interesting thing is I grew up in a household of six. Okay. okay. Uh, plus my parents. Okay. So we were six kids and yeah, maybe as we came along, we sort of exhibited that attitude. I mean, take a look at a two-year-old. I mean, don't they talk about the terrible twos? Boy, yes. is that not narcissistic or what? You know, <laughs> but it's, it's a phase that we go through that I think best, best summarized says, Okay, here's where the family and the parents come in and they start to teach the child, not necessarily mold them per se, although I suppose you could put that in that category, but they start to teach that child that they're not the only one, that there are others in this household who require their attention too. And, uh, you know, we're not neglecting you. That is not what it's about. And I'd have to say that my parents did one heck of a great job with all of us uh, in that process. I'm going to go to another definition here. I'm going to flip over so that you can find it as well. You can go to page uh, one, two, three, and we're going to look at, uh, <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, nar okay. Narcanese. 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 Tell us what Narcanese is and what that category is. So Narcanese is a word that I developed uh, and I, I developed it, it as um, what Narcanese is, is just like every language has its own dialect. I call the dialect of the narcissist Narcanese. And so, for example, uh, a narcissist will do such things as a word salad you. And a word salad is when you go to the narcissist and you say, I am not comfortable with what's happening in our relationship. And I am not specifically comfortable with this situation. And I really need an explanation because I've been hurt by it. And I'm not feeling good. Let's discuss this. And the next thing you know, the narcissist is and they have thrown so many words into the conversation that you end up just shaking your head. Sometimes they blame shift. You're on the other side of it and suddenly apologizing for something you did when you're trying to address the violation that was done to you. And it's a technique called word salad. And what I realized uh, on my recovery journey is that there's a whole set of words and terms that exists just within the narcissistic relationship that we needed to start 
uh, putting them into vocabulary form. And rather than sit there with that brain fog saying, I don't understand what happens, we're able to say, okay, stop word salading me and answer the dang question. <laughs> so that's that's what Narcanese is. It's the official, what is the, the, the definition that I have? Is the official language of the narcissist that includes both spoken word, unspoken and written word, as well as behavior and tactics that the narcissist uses while in an episode to try to dupe gain control or fuel source off of others. And by the way, if you are, let's just say you are living or working with a narcissist and they're throwing Narcanese at you, then you are actually living in the country of Narcanesia. <laughs> That's right, Narkyville. <laughs> Narkyville, Narcanesia, Narkistan. <laughs> exactly. You know what? And and my words aren't aren't the holy grail. It's whatever works to be able to, you know, get your grip around it. And what one of the reasons I, this is a good place for me to share this, is that one of the reasons why I, I wrote the book and it came about very quickly is it was around eight, nine months ago. And a friend of mine went through, um, uh, found herself in a divorce, getting the discard, which is a very narcissistic thing when they end relationships and just on the floor, not didn't see it coming, et cetera, et cetera. So she calls me. She's like, I know that you specialize in this. And, I, you know, can you just help, help give me a few minutes of your time? And so the first thing she does is is she's like, and all, all of a sudden all I know is that they, he, you know, he was there one day and just gone the next. I said, yeah, that's called the discard. The what? The discard. The discard is phase three in the narcissistic cycle where where they just they put you out like trash. They're just done. They've moved on with their life and they're off to another fuel source. She goes, oh, my God. And then she said, and. You know, it it it, it was just um, so crazy because um, it's it's like uh, I was everything to him, but but then one day he would love me, and the next thing day he would hate me. I said, yeah, that's called the hurt to rescue, or the the adore to abhor technique. And she's like, what? And I'm like, yeah, it's a technique that they use to break you down, to build you up, to break you down, to build you up, so that you become dependent on them, and they can rely on you for a fuel source. What? What's a fuel source? The fuel source is what the narcissist lives off of, and you're giving it to them and helping keep them emotionally alive. And then she said the other thing about, you know, we got into an argument, and the words all made no sense. I said, yeah, I got word salad. So this conversation was taking place and she says, she says, Tracy, why don't you, you should take all these words that you know and put them in, in one handbook so that we newbies can just open up the, this dictionary and understand what we're dealing with. And so I did that. And the reason that this book is so effective is because my mother raised me with, with this uh, concept. And she said, you know, Tracy, when your body hurts or when there's something in your life that hurts. Um, or is causing you pain and it doesn't have a name it's like fighting a ghost and that you can't grab a hold of it and pull it into your life and mend it and heal it and nurture it or if it doesn't best serve you eliminate it from your life but when something has a name you can grab a hold of that you can bring it into your life you can put a boundary on it you can put uh, uh, some glue and help mend it back together or if it's not proper behavior, you can eliminate it from your life. So Narctionary is all about just giving name to the many ghosts that haunt the victims of abuse. Narcissistic. DrTracy.com, dot TV, I should say. DrTracy.tv. That's DrTracy.tv is her website. Narctionary is the title of the book. And this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host. And, uh, I find this fascinating. I want to ask you on a, and it, this either is a sidebar or it is actually uh, really connected here. Um, there are many of us and probably yourself included based upon your own personal story, which we will uh, get into in just a moment. Um, we have all dealt with people with addictions and many times uh, these individuals have uh, these addictions for lots of different reasons. And the reasons really aren't that relevant. The fact is they are addicted. We love them. We would love to get them help, but they have to choose to get help and so on and so forth. But all of their decisions are based upon this addiction. And I'd even heard this one example where this one person, um, alcoholic, who hadn't had a drink for, say, let's just say six months. Now they go, wow, I haven't had a drink for six months. 
I'm going to go celebrate. I'm going to go have a glass of whatever alcoholic to which the response by uh, their family, their friends, what have you was, uh, no, 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 no. That is not how this works. Okay. Just because you haven't had a drink for six months, doesn't mean you now can celebrate with a drink. Is the, is is an addictive personality narcissistic, or is well, it a, think, again a different kind of narcissism? I think that what I have discovered in the world of addiction is that um, addicts tend to have a lot of narcissistic characteristics out of survival to keep their disease going. Uh, when they come out if that person is able to, in their sober state of mind, become a truth teller, uh, realize how their choices affect other people, which is all part of the AA process of, you know, taking that accountability, taking that inventory, who have I hurt by my actions? How do I best apologize and make amends for that actions? How do I not do those actions anymore? Those are all very non-narcissistic responses in life. But when a narcissist, it, when, an, when an addict is in full-blown addict form, they don't care. They don't care how their drinking affects your life. They're not even thinking about it. All they're thinking about is their next high, which that, that lack of empathy towards another person is a very narcissistic characteristic. Hmm. You know, um, this is very interesting because I had to come up with a plan for myself. And then I want to talk about some of your plans as well as your, your specific story that has brought you here to us today. But I came up with this sequence of, of steps and it was the only way that I could escape for myself, for myself. Um, this, this, I don't want to say narcissistic abuse, but at least from an intellectual level, um, the, the, the barrage of narcissistic phrasing and terminology and lying and this, and that, and the other. And the first step was the, absolutely. And usually the first step is the hardest. I had to say it out loud. I didn't want to say it out loud because of what I had to say. I had to say to the narcissist teacher, thank you for teaching me how not to be. I didn't want to call them a teacher. Teachers are too important, too valuable, uh, and 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 so on and so on and so on. And I didn't want to, but you know what? And then I had to move on to the next step for me was, um, uh, if I can remember, oh, I forgive you. But more importantly, I forgive me for allowing myself to be dragged into this quagmire. Mm -hmm. The third one was a question from a very humble and human heart position. What is it that you're so afraid of that makes you speak and behave the way you do? Because to me, a narcissist and a bully are both coming from fear. Is that is that accurate or incorrect? Well, I think that uh, that anybody who bullies is um, operating in narcissism. So, you know, it's bullies are narcissistic behavior. I have the right to treat this other person. I get high and powerful when I see them fear me. Uh, these are, these are all narcissistic characteristics and traits and, and agendas. So bullies are narcissistic. And when you ask them, you know, why would you behave that way? Depending on see, narcissism is a spectrum disorder. Okay. So let me just jump in here really quickly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, we mm -hmm. all need healthy narcissism, which is right here that allows us to keep the good in and the bad out. This is things that, uh, uh, you don't get to come in and destroy my life. No, I'm not going to allow you to define me. These are, these are healthy boundaries that that sense of holding on to thyself. As it goes on up the scale, it then merges into narcissistic characteristics. And narcissistic characteristics are just very difficult people. Um, you find yourself very exhausted by the time you're around them. Um, all roads lead back to self. There's a limited amount of candidness that you can um, experience with them. And they will have more narcissistic characteristics, benign moments, narcissistic characteristics, benign moments. As it continues to go on up the scale, it then merges into NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. And this is when somebody, the character of somebody's personality is rooted in, in 
too many narcissistic traits. Now, um, and then from that, it's antisocial personality disorder, disorder, sociopath and psychopath. And these are people that you just want to stay away from because they are, they are dangerous people. Now, one of the things I want to say is you had mentioned something earlier about um, politics and victims, the victim mentality that takes place. And one of the things I want to say is that traditionally we had one definition of a narcissist, which is this very grandiose person, very self-absorbed, all, all roads have to lead back to self, et cetera, et cetera, when we think of narcissists. Research now shows that there are so many other different types of narcissism, one of them being, which is one of the sneakiest ones, something that is called a covert narcissist. And one of the primary ways that you can discover a covert narcissist is they don't want to take responsibility for their life. They're a perpetual victim that there is no matter what happens, somebody's always picking on them. Somebody um, is always mistreating them. And because of that, the world needs to stop and, and make them feel okay. And they are entitled to the world stopping and doing that. And if you look at it, it's a different between, you know, I'm, I'm not a victim, though I do believe that we can be victimized by certain things, but I don't believe that we, we, are in a healthy way should step into that victim role because that's when you, without noticing it can become a covert narcissist, which means like I'm broken. Other people, it's other people's fault. You're taking no ownership of your life and somebody else is responsible for coming in and making me okay. And that's covert narcissism right there. Yeah. Well, I, I can tell you that, that I have had dealings with people over my lifetime um, and I, we, we talk about choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. That is one of our slogans, uh, on this program. And, um, a lot of times I would think that many of these people who are exhibit exhibiting this narcissistic behavior, as well as those who are being abused by the narcissist aren't aware of the different choices they actually have because they really haven't been exposed to other ways of thinking. Maybe they've been kept from, I mean, I, I know the, the biggest paradox right now in this country for me is this conversation about education during COVID and the parents wanted the kids to go back to school, but it's the same people who wanted their kids to go back to school who were complaining about the low standards of the educational system. And I'm going, so what you're saying is that you would send your child back into a burning building. That's what you're saying. It made no sense to me, <laughs> but it seems as though that's that's part of the deficiency, not the the formal educational system, but our um, street smart, so to speak, or what we learn from one another. You and I, I'm learning from you uh, on this program, and so I'm getting an education here, and I get to take this information and I get to utilize it. So it seems as though a lot of these folks, they don't know that they have other choices. Is that a fair assessment? Well, absolutely, because, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And most of the time in my situation that I was raised in an environment where there was a narcissist. And so the behavior of a narcissist, an adult narcissist, I thought it's just how all adults behaved. And so it had baselined itself for me. So for me to actually be able to sense danger, my my radars were way off because, you know, burning was normal. And so what are the things and one of the dynamics within an abusive relationship is, is it's a formula. And what the narcissist needs to do is to break you down so that you can become what's called their, their primary fuel source. And they get fueled high, however charged, however you want to use it, on two emotions of you, your praise and your worship of them, which they will shortly get bored of, and then your crying and pining for them. Uh, and your brokenness from them. That could get some high because they see that they're so powerful over another human being. Now, one of the things is that I, I wanted to touch on based on an earlier conversation that we talked about the spectrum going this way. Mm -hmm. One day in my recovery journey, I began, I asked a question, I'm like, well, what's over here? And what research is now showing is over here is a condition called self-love de deficiency disorder. And so what I did to 
create huge change in, in my recovery process because I was one of those, you know, what is narcissism? How do I change the narcissism? What can I do? And how can I do it better? And all that. And I made the choice that one day I will become educated on, on the chemical makeup of the narcissist. But my real focus of change and empowerment will become healing my self-love deficiency disorder because somebody who has self-love deficiency disorder and somebody who suffers from narcissistic characteristics on up the spectrum, it's the different side of the same coin. Both lives are based in trauma. Only the result of that trauma manifested itself in two different personalities in two different ways. But this is why they, they can easily stay together because it, it's, it's the polar opposite of the same trauma cord. So when you begin to heal, the way I handle healing, and I have a, a one-year recovery program called Reclaiming Me, is we focus on the journey to self-love because when you raise that foundation underneath you and you build a steely foundation of self-love underneath you, you vib vi vibrationally just begin to align in a different level than the narcissist. And all the things that you used to tolerate, they just become intolerable because your definition of, of self-value has changed. Your definition of what you want in a relationship has changed. The definition of, of self-honor has changed. And these are all the things that, that keep you on the recovery journey. And you don't even have to focus on the narcissist. You just have to become aware, which is in the book, of what they're doing so that when they do it, you're able to say, no, that's narcissism. That has a name. And I, I, don't, I don't love like that anymore. And I have lots of mantras in my program. And going back to what you just said, my one of my mantras is, especially during in my recovery, I am more powerful than I remember. I am more powerful than I remember. I am more powerful than I remember. You know, this. I want to talk more about this uh, aspect of self-love with you, Dr. Tracy Kemble, as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. Great. I love it. One second, one second here. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for being with us here with Tracy Kemble, Dr. Tracy Kemble. And we're talking about narcissionary, that is the dictionary of uh, narcissistic abuse recovery. And uh, we are uh, talking about this. And by the way, the website, once again, is drtracy.tv. That's D R T R. A-C-Y dot TV. We hope that you'll go there. We will be linked to that website as well, uh, uh, doctor, uh, so people can uh, find out more about you, get a copy of the book, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I want to talk to you um, if I, about this aspect of self-love because there is, I would venture, there is a part of narcissism that is just that. It is self-love. Um, but at the same time, for example, I just got an email that started out and, and it sounds really, it sounds great. I mean, you know, it's really cool. It says, um, stop acting so small. You are the universe in, uh, in, uh, uh, aesthetic motion. I don't know what aesthetic motion is, but, and, and I'm getting these different emails just, you know, it's like, they're trying to pump me up and I'm going, okay, but you know what? I'm happy with where I'm at and I'm content and so forth. So I'm, I'm thinking we need to maybe define for those who are looking for recovery. And that's what we're looking at here right now at this moment. How do you make sure you don't cross the line from self-love to narcissism, to self-centered Love. Yeah, well, there's a there's a very very big difference between. Um, uh, I get asked I get asked a handful of questions. So I'll go through them. Tracy, isn't self love a form of narcissism? No, self love is self love. It's the honor, and the understanding of one's self and value. It's the conscious relationship that we have with ourselves. Narcissists don't self-love. They, believe it or not, they self-loathe. What they do have is self-lover, where I will love and value myself. They have this, like, infatuation in love with themselves. It's a very shallow uh, form of love. So 
uh, that that's the very big difference. The second question I get asked a lot is, if I step into this journey of self-love, and I was guilty of this, am I going to turn out like the narcissist? Because the last thing that I want in my life is to end up like the person who destroyed my life. Mm. And the the answer that I have to that is that question right there means you're not narcissistic because a narcissist would never ask that question. <laughs> they don't care um, how their life affects other people. They don't have the ability to look inside their inner terrain. And does the pendulum swing? Yes, it does. If you go from somebody who doesn't have a boundary and is learning how to set a boundary and it comes across a bit rough and tough, this is just the pendulum trying to find its balance. And if you stay in your recovery journey, you're, you will, you know, you will learn your own, you know, you will learn if you're being a covert narcissist and, and learn to make changes, but it's a matter of really understanding there's a big difference between operating in a foundation of self-love being a narcissistic self-lover. Mm. Well, I know that as I were my, as I personally was going through a few things in my life over the last few years, um, I was always counseled by my, I call it my network. All right. And I'm very lucky to have established that network in my life. I was counseled, Richard, you can do all of these other things, but make sure you take care of you. And I thought about that. And, yeah. And that, and, and yeah. And I got that, but I thought, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. I hadn't even put a connection on that in terms of, um, uh, you know, in terms of that, you know what I'm saying? In other words, I hadn't yeah. thought about it in that way. Because I always thought that, oh, you know, I, I'm going to get caught here and I'm going to be this and I'm going to be that and I'm going to be the other. And I'm fine the way that I am, you know, and I'm happy. Uh, you know, I know I'm taking this stuff from this person, whether it was a, whether it was a, a bully or what have you. But um, I don't know. I just thought it's OK. And they said, no, you need to take care of you. And I began to understand that. And so I'd spend time at the beach or I, I actually worked with a woman here in town who uh, helped me to write a song. I'd never written a song before, but she helped me to write my song as to what I was going through. And, and that was very therapeutic for me and, and so forth. What kind of programs do you have for the recovering Abuse, abuse, uh, 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 narcissist. I don't know. The victim. Crazy. The person. The victim. Okay, we'll we'll use the word victim. Okay. Yeah, the person who has been victimized, <laughs> or their life has been affected by the the words and actions of a narcissist. So I run an amazing program, and it has been around for twenty seven years. It has evolved over the years with the things that we learn about abuse and abuse trauma and abuse recovery. Um, like I said, 27 years, it takes place every Wednesday night and every Thursday night. And in 27 years, we've never missed uh, a, a day that our team shows up and is offering recovery. The program is called Reclaiming Me. It's a one-year comprehensive program um, with six modules. The, sixth, the first module is called, what is this? And we really explain what is narcissism, what you've been through, um, what is narcissistic abuse trauma? Like we just give name to the broad strokes of it. The second module is called what happened to me. And this is a module that in studying the behaviors of the narcissist, I've identified 13 different techniques that they do to fuel source other people. And what happens to you when you are on the receiving end of that? Um, the third module is called Love and the Narcissist, and this is breaking all the soul ties, the trauma, the trauma bonds, the love addiction, the codependency, the spiritual bonds, everything that keeps us tethered uh, to that polar opposite condition that we're dealing with. The next um, um, class after that, there's a very specific trauma wound that happens to people who go through narcissistic abuse. 
Yeah, many people get treated for PTSD, but that is not what they suffer from. A narcissistic abuse victim suffers from something called CPTSD. And there is a very specific methodology of healing in order to be able to um, um, unleash those, those deeply uh, settled trauma wounds. Then the next uh, module after that is called when no contact is not an option because in the world of narcissistic recovery, they say, just leave, just leave and never contact that person again. And in some cases that's not possible. If it is a parent, if it is a, a, a the, the parent of your child, if it's somebody that you work with, et cetera, et cetera. So we really need to learn how to hold on to ourselves if we have to continue to encounter certain narcissists. And then the last module is all about um, love, love and life after narcissism, how we can learn to grow and learn to love in new ways and not build altars to the abuse and learn from what we've been through, but become a, a better version of self. Mm. Very interesting. And it's very important because I noticed even in my own life that it's, um, I tell you, when you don't take care of yourself, you get weaker and you get weaker and you get weaker. And then you start to become self-destructive, don't you? I mean, it's by virtue of not taking care of yourself, you are in essence kind of whittling away at your own physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual health. Well, let me give you, for any of our listeners who are saying, you know, if I take care of myself, isn't that being completely selfish? And especially women feel this way that we need to put everyone first in our life. And one of the things that I learned on my self-love journey, and I'm, I'm working on a book called The Journey to Self-Love right now, is, is that when I struggle with that, am I being too selfish? Am I only thinking about myself? What I realized is that if I don't live out the life that Tracy Kemble needs to live out. So when we begin this journey to recovery, and is I've there, there is, there is, uh, there is no real end. I mean, it this is going to be for life in a matter, in a matter of speaking, but there does come a, it's like you, you, you're going to be going up and up and up and up working on your recovery, but eventually you'll kind of maybe level out a little bit, but it will always be, you'll always be in recovery, kind of like the alcoholic, even if they go through recovery and they've been sober for 35 years, in a manner of speaking, they're still in recovery, right? Yeah, it depends on the person and and the division, the the their road to recovery. Some alcoholics need to remind themselves every day that they're alcoholics to stay sober, and some need to move beyond the definition of alcoholism, um, and they want to stay sober because being sober is just a much better way of life for them. So, to me, it's whatever it takes. When it comes to 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 narcissistic abuse recovery. You definitely have to put yourself in a very protective environment for quite some time because strictly alone, the brain channels in your in your in, the, in your brain, the electrical channels in your brain, they will default into certain actions and reactions. And you have to go through and retrain yourself on how to respond to life differently and in a more nurturing, self-protective ways. Wow. And, and there's a part of me I know that I ask, I used to ask this question years ago when I first started doing these kinds of interviews. Uh, so how long is this going to take? And I know better than that now is there's no clock on it. There is no stopwatch on it. It takes as long as it takes, right? It takes, well, yes, because, you know, part of the process is the grieving process and there's no time clock on the grieving process. But when I get asked that question, and I've asked that question myself, you know, how long is this going to take? When is change going to happen? And the best piece of advice that I was given was when you really want it to. You know how quickly change can happen like that. It's the second that you say, you know what? Done, 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 done. I am mm. done. I am not engaging in this for one more second. I I refuse to be this definition to myself. And it's the intolerance of, of your today that creates your tomorrow. Mm. And so you can completely change. Now, you have to learn how to become that new person. That change can happen like that. But you have to become a student of of what it means to be a different person than that when you are. And I was just working with a client a couple of weeks ago and I said, you know, the, the thing about reaching dysfunctional 
choices, places in our life is that we walked for a certain amount of time deep into the desert. And the day that you had your awakening and you woke up and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I'm in the middle of the desert. You have a choice. You, you can keep walking into the desert and become more dysfunctional, more disconnected from the mainstream of life. You can stay where you are and be a victim and wait for somebody to come rescue you. Or you can turn around and start, start walking out of the, the desert back to the mainstream of life. And the question was, well, how long is it going to take before I hit the mainstream of life? And I said, it depends on how fast you want to walk or run or fly. <laughs> Me, when I had made that choice, I couldn't get out of the desert fast enough. And I woke up every day with the most important thing in my life is getting myself well and getting back into the mainstream of life. So, you know, it's it, we are more powerful than we remember. Used to be one of the questions I would ask my guests at the end of the program. How powerful are we? <laughs> and uh, we are we are amazing, amazing beings. What so, about uh, a a spiritual component to this? We talk about uh, people participating in the decade of perfect vision, where we want them to spend time going within to that quiet, still, calm, peaceful place. And listening to that still small voice. Now, this has absolutely nothing to do with any philosophy per se, any religion uh, or institution, because we've been hearing that voice since we arrived on the planet. Yeah. It's whether or not we respond to and follow, as I say, the promptings. Yes. Talk to us about that component in recovery. Well, uh, you know, one of my gifts is I get these amazing downloads. I, I live my life by a spiritual philosophy that is called divine order. And divine order says the perfect solution for my life is already in place as long as I align myself with it. So I am responsible for keeping uh, my heart in joy, my, my physical, emotional, psychological being safe um, believing in the good of life, you know, all, all the, all the practices that have taken me years to, to get to, but I, I think that it is the primary part of recovery. There are actually in my recovery classes in, we spend one segment of the, of the recovery process to say, you can do, um, and say, you can do your physical work, you can do your mental work, you can do your emotional work, but to really recover and to change, you got to do your spiritual work too. You have to rely on that that bigger source within you, where all the wisdom of the world of the world rests. If we open ourselves up to that knowledge, it's there. Mm. We just gotta settle our our fears, mm. you know, and, and settle down the settle down the thoughts, and and it will start transmitting through loud and clear. There's a biblical passage from the Old Testament that goes. Train up a child in the way he or she should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. And that's a double-edged sword, because if you raise a child in a particular way, do not be surprised at how they turn out as an adult. And if you are looking at an adult, you can see how they were raised as a child. Are we making more and more narcissists? in this country and in the world? I mean, is is um, is Putin a narcissist? Uh, are the leaders, uh, the dictators, say, in China or the Philippines or any other country, are they a bunch of narcissists or would they fall under different categories that we're not talking about here? I, I think that if you can look at a person and say that they're lacking empathy for how their choices affect other people's lives, and that's primarily one of the number one characteristics of narcissism. Mm. If you take it down to a less uh, geopolitical viewpoint like that and just go on to social media and you see a whole generation of people who have a need to, rather than listen, they want to be heard and they want to be looked at and they're, they're not satisfied with, with how they are. And so they jump from, thought to thought to thought to statement to statement to statement, all with that hope of getting a like. So I think that that we have only begun to see, I think that we have seen in the, in the history of the world, uh, narcissists and sociopaths and psychopath leaders, for sure. I think that what we're really going to start seeing now is just this heavy input of the narcissistic characteristics and people with invisibility 
that are coming across as being too visible. We are talking with Dr. Tracy Kemble, and we are talking about narcissism and her book, Narctionary. And it is just that. It is the Narcissistic Abuse Recovery Dictionary. Her website is dr. That's uh, Dr. Tracy, D-R-T-R-A-C-Y dot TV. And this is Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and I thank you so much for being with us, uh, Doctor. This has been a real eye-opener, I hope, for a lot of folks. We could have gone through a lot more def- a lot more definitions, um, but I'm glad you went through some of the ones that you did. And um, I, I, you know, it seems to me, but from your explanation just a moment ago about social media and this current generation, we're going to be dealing with a lot of narcissists in the coming decades. That, that's exactly. just my observation. I, I would agree. And can I end with just my favorite word in the book? Yes, please do. It is a phrase that is called poop in your soup. And it is <laughs> such an important term for me to learn because I was a professional bu- about accepting unacceptable behaviors, whether it be in small doses or large doses. And one day in my recovery, somebody said, Tracy, tolerating a little bit of narcissism or a lot of narcissism is like having poop in your soup and poop in your soup is never okay. (laughs) So (laughs) all of our listeners, no matter how small the doses of narcissism, we are not to tolerate the wrong behaviors of other people. Oh my heaven. Poop in your soup is never okay. That's all I got to say. (laughs) That's what you've said an awful lot even before that. So we thank you for being a part of our program. I do have three final questions. I want to ask you before we wrap things up but i do want to thank you for listening to and watching tell me your story new paradigms for a new world we are giving you choices boy we've given you a lot of choices and knowledge of those choices as well um to help make your dreams come true we're here sundays at 7 a.m and 7 p.m monday mornings at 1 a.m and wednesdays at 9 a.m for our special edition of tell me your story we uh, stream live at those times at richarddugan.com We also podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations. We're also on YouTube where you can watch these interviews. We hope that you will. And if you can't subscribe or you don't want to subscribe, maybe you can at least click the notification so that when I post a new conversation, you'll be able to listen to it. We also ask that if you can support the work that we are doing, uh, we would really appreciate it. Every penny goes towards uh, every element that we have, including the cost of SoundCloud and some of the other work that is done. Uh, But uh, we have PayPal. It's there for your security as well as ours. All you have to do is type in Richard at RichardDugan.com when they ask you for the email address to whom to send the uh, contribution. And we thank you, thank you, thank you for those who have and those who will. And also, as I mentioned earlier, please spend some time going within and listening to that still small voice in that quiet, calm, peaceful place we call your inner life. Some call it an inner closet. Uh, We can call it whatever you want. Just take some time. And maybe even while you're doing that, do it out in nature. If you're in the city, then find a park somewhere. Boy, I tell you what, I'd love to find Central Park, but I'm living in a heck of a park as it is, uh, 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 Dr. Tracy, uh, as it is up in nature above Santa Barbara, where um, uh, we're we're in a great place. So we encourage you to do that. Hope you will. And with all of that being said, we go to our final three questions for our guest. And the first of those three is, who is Tracy Kemble? Oh, my goodness. Who am I? Let me see. I am somebody who learned the most valuable lesson in my life, which is the journey to self-love. And I am somebody who used to think that this life wasn't worth having me around to somebody who is in love with life and in love with people and understood that that knowledge came to me because I I took the courage to go to my inner drains and um, get to know that this person that I am is good enough to be here. And now I'm, I live out my life just doing the expressions of the great I am inside of me. Wonderful. What is your life's purpose? My life's purpose is to, how do I like to say this? That um, I get these beautiful downloads from the divine. They are the recipes of life. 
I have been lucky enough to get the recipes wrong and now I get the recipes right. And I want to get these life recipes into the hands, especially of women, so that they can be, do, and have everything that their heart desires along this beautiful existence called life. Mm. And I hope you get this movie reference to the final question. What was your best day? What was my best day? My best day was the day that I realized that I'm enough. And that from the day that my father's sperm and my mother's egg met in my mother's womb, I was enough then. And I came to this world enough. And I forgot that for a long time. And other people told me different. But the day that I chose to reclaim my enoughness was the game changer of my life. Well, yes, indeed. You are enough. I am enough. He and she is enough. And we need to start claiming that. And I thank you so much for being with us here on the program. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And I thank you for listening to and watching Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World, where we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And until our next broadcast, podcast, videocast, love to lull, Jeanette, I am listening. And dad, be happy. <laughs>